Good morning, Calvary. Man, I'm thrilled to have you guys here. Um, I, I just wanna call the elephant out in the room, at least for me, it feels this way. Two weeks ago, Pastor Bob tried out this new microphone assign. Has anyone else noticed this? So I'm Pastor, you look like Justin Bieber now. I want you to just, so if we start dancing up here, this really, it's not our fault, really. This just comes with a mic. Um, I grew up with a family with six children, six children. And uh, I had four brothers and two sisters. And uh, you see the, my four brothers, or all of us together on the screen behind me here. And that's us, uh, uh, just a year ago or so at my brother's wedding. But of course, at one time, we were young kids. And there's one thing that's very true about growing up with a lot of brothers is that oftentimes we would do things for fun that to the sane and normal mind would be utterly perplexing and confusing. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, we used to do this thing, and I don't know whose idea it was, but we had a dog who had an invisible fence, and they have little shock collars, and we thought it was a good idea that one summer that we would go out and see how bad this thing actually hurt. Uh, so at first, it just started off where we just have it in our hands and walk across the, the line, and we'd yelp like a dog as well as it goes across. Some of my brothers actually put it around their neck and went across, and uh, all the neighborhood kids would laugh at us. We thought it was hilarious. We had a, a good time. We also used to play this game called Sting Pong. Has anyone ever heard heard or played the game Sting Pong before. Uh, Sting Pong, it's a really simple game, really. Uh, it's the game of ping pong, but anytime you lose a point, the other person would take the ping pong ball and smack it at you as hard as they could. You had to lift up your shirt so it smacks your back, and we would have welts and big marks. We looked like we had leprosy on our back by the end of it. And, and to be fair, I didn't play this game much. I just liked to watch my brothers smack each other over and over again. That was a lot of fun. We also played a game uh, where we would roll a dice, and if a certain number came up on the die, we, you would be allowed to punch your brother as hard as you can on the arm. <laughs> and we would do it for hours on end. We had big bruises back and forth. And don't ask us why we did this. We thought it was hilarious. People would laugh, we would laugh, and we just had a really good time doing so. And uh, these things are pretty trivial, they're pretty small in this way, and maybe you don't think so, maybe you think that we need some help, and you're probably right, but that's a conversation for a different time. <laughs> but these things are pretty small uh, that we would go back to over and over again just for fun, just because we would did it. But as much as we don't want it to be true, as much as we don't want to admit this uh, among ourselves, is that oftentimes we will go back to things, and we, as full-grown, mature adults, we will do something over and over and over again that causes us pain, that causes the people around us pain, and every time we, we go back and we scratch our heads wondering, why did I do that? Why did I go back to that again? It could be an action, it could be a belief system, it could be a relationship that you have gone back to over and again and you know it is going to cause you pain but yet we do it anyway. Today my goal is a couple of different things. I'd like to be able to dive in, into two different pathways that the Apostle Paul in Galatians, he, he seems to believe that we are commonly tempted to go back to over and over and over again, things that would cause us pain that we are highly susceptible to. And Paul doesn't just call it pain, he says it is a form of slavery and bondage. So I wanna identify both of those two things, but, but even more than that, by the end of this, I would love to be able to provide a pathway. How can we, how can we as people of God live a life that is, that is firm in freedom where we can choose to reject the voices that would tell us to go back into slavery? How many of you would like to learn how to live a life that way? Amen? So Paul opens up in uh, Galatians chapter five, starting in verse two, he says this, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Remember that phrase. In fact, I'm gonna have you say it with me. Stand firm, therefore. Stand firm. And do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Paul is operating under this assumption uh, that, that we and his Galatian people would be tempted to go back to slavery again that as people were free of slavery, they, they were living in freedom, and now they are tempted to go back into slavery once again. He's just operating under this assumption that we would be tempted to do so, which is a really strange thought for us. However, this is not a new idea for Paul. 
In fact, one of the, the most famous stories in all of the Bible is the story of the Exodus, uh, when God delivers his people out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. For hundreds of years, Israel have been enslaved by the Egyptian people. God brings them out and they experience freedom. And, and he says, and God tells them for, for your generation and for your children's generation, there will be freedom and blessing for your people. This amazing, beautiful story. But the funny thing is, they start wandering through the wilderness and they start to get low on food and water in just mere days after being delivered from slavery. The Israelite people go to Moses and God and they beg him, say, bring us back to Egypt. We wanna go back. We wanna go back to Egypt. At least in Egypt, we knew where our food was coming from. At least in Egypt, we had plenty of water. At least in Egypt, we had a place to sleep at night. And as the reader, we look at this and we're like, these guys are crazy. Like, yeah, we get it, your situation is difficult right now, but surely this is better than slavery. Not just for you, but for your children and for your future generations. And we look at this and we say, why on earth would they be willing to be subjugated back to slavery? Again, why? This makes no sense to us. However, we're not so different. And I believe this to be true that we often drift towards what promises security. We drift towards what promises security. So allow me to ask you this question, dig deep here for a minute. What things do you tend to go back to over and over again? And you know it's gonna cause you pain, but you do it anyway because it promises some kind of comfort or some kind of security for you. And all of a sudden, we're not so different from the Israelite people and we're not so different from the Galatian people. And this is the tension that Paul is wrestling with in Galatians, the people who have decided to go back again and again into slavery. So he continues. He says, stand firm in the freedom of Christ. Stand firm in the freedom of Christ. Verse two says this. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who would unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Yeesh. This is harsh language. He straight up says, Paul says, hey, if you choose circumcision, then Christ is of no advantage to you. In fact, you have completely severed yourself from grace and from Christ himself, which is terrifying language, right? And the silly question that has to be asked, I think it's, it's worth asking, does this mean that anyone who has had that medical procedure done, that they have severed themselves from Christ among being severed from other things? Take a minute to get that one. <laughs> I thought it was funny. I grew up with four brothers, so. <laughs> so seriously though, does it mean that if, you, if, that has, if that is something that you've chosen to do, that you are severed from Christ? And, and of course, no. Of course, this is not what Paul is talking about. Paul is setting up two different paradigms or two different pathways, or even more importantly, two different things that we can trust in. And he calls one of it the way of circumcision and the second one is the way of uncircumcision. And the way of circumcision is essentially, it is our desire to trust in our own ability to make ourselves right before God. 
It's me saying that I'm trusting in my own moralism, my own ability to follow the rules, the regulations, the law of God, and that is what makes me more right before God, that makes me loved by God, that gives me some kind of advantages in his kingdom by the way that I can act and behave. And Paul says that this is the way of circumcision. The way of uncircumcision is very similar, but yet very different. And it's not God's laws that you're following, it's your own. It's essentially saying that it, I get to choose what laws and what rules I follow. I get to choose what I worship and what I love and what I do. I get to make and dictate the rules of my life. And it is by those standards that, that make me right before God or before others or before myself. It's the way of uncircumcision. And Paul says that both of those things are not good. He says neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. I don't think we can fully grasp how profound of a statement that was for Paul to make who grew up in a Jewish heritage and a Jewish scholar for all of his life. He says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. Both of them are useless. So what he is saying here is that if you, if you, choose to justify yourself, to trust in the way of circumcision, to trust in your own righteousness and your own love before God by how well you can follow his rules and laws. And he says, then you have severed yourself from Christ himself. He says, you are trusting a very different means of grace. You can either trust in your own means of grace or you can trust in Christ. And he says, if you choose the way of circumcision, you are removing yourself from grace and from Christ himself. You have severed yourself. And, and he's not, he, he seems to be making a very hard line here. He says so this really weird phrase um, that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And what he's saying here is that when you put yeast or leaven, I'm not a baker, but when you put yeast or leaven into a bread, you can't just expect it to just affect one little spot. It affects the entire lump of bread. What he's saying is, is that if you are trusting, if your means of grace is trusting in your own ability to gain love and favor from God, he says you can't have that and Jesus. That the two are incompatible with each other. You have contaminated the whole process. So Paul says, choose freedom, stand firm in the freedom of Christ. But it also works the other way around too. That many of us love to say things like, well, I love Jesus, right? I love Jesus, I love the way he spoke, I love the way he talked to people, I love the way he treated people, I love his just demeanor and the way he performed miracles, I love Jesus, but I'm not so sure I would like Jesus to tell me how I should live my life or what I should do or what I should love or who I should worship, so I'm gonna keep Jesus here, but I'm not going to allow him to tell me how to live my life. And Paul says you can't do that. He says, you have, you, you have leavened the whole lump. You've tainted everything. He says that you have severed yourself from Christ when you choose one of these two things. And, and that's why he says that, that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. If you are choosing your own method of grace outside of Jesus, it's useless. So his encouragement right from the very beginning is to stand firm in the freedom of Christ. And Paul isn't, Paul isn't saying this just because he wants to control our lives. I think that's a fear that often people think that the Bible and the authors of the Bible just wanted to control people. Paul is not saying this because he wants to control us or, or, or limit the things that we can do in our lives. Paul is saying this because he knows that when we choose either of these options, it causes pain and hurt, not just to us, but to the people around us and puts us into another form of slavery. Why, do, why does Paul know this? And, and why is Paul using such harsh language? It's because Paul lived that life. Paul lived that life. Before Jesus, he trusted in his own ability to keep the law and he, his own righteousness was dictated by how well he could follow God's rules, his laws, his Jewish customs and traditions. And it led him down a path where he sought to murder and seek the blood of people who disagreed with him. It was a form of slavery for him. How many of you guys know that that seems like that's kind of where our world is right now? So Paul recognizes, he understands that this is a form of slavery and, and he pleads with the Galatian people as he would with us to stand firm in the freedom of Christ. 
What things do you go back to? What things have a hold of your heart, have a hold of your family, have a hold of your mind? Paul's encouragement is to stand firm in the freedom of Christ. One of the last questions he asks in this passage, it's a super piercing question. He's speaking to his Galatian people and he says, you guys were doing so good. You were running well. Who convinced you to to stop obeying the truth? Who hindered you from operating in freedom? Who who was it that, that convinced you, that persuaded you to leave behind freedom and to go back into slavery? He said, get rid of those people. Get rid of that guy, whoever he was. Who convinced you to do this? And Paul seems to operate under this assumption again that there will be voices external, whether internal or external from us that would attempt to bring us back into a mode of slavery and bondage and pain. That there will be voices that will attempt to persuade us to move in a direction that is opposite of the gospel of Jesus that would bring us back into slavery. And and Paul says, "Who who is doing this? Whose voice are you listening to? What are you allowing your ears to influence you? Who is attempting to bring you down this pathway? Who is doing this is encouragement again not to sound like a broken record but is to stand firm in the freedom of Christ to resist the voices that would be attempting to pull us back but here's the problem we've all just admitted at least we've all come into this agreement right from the beginning that all of us all of us have something in our lives that we will tend to go back to over and over and over again, right? We've all come into agreement that it's just part of our nature. So the question is, what does it mean to stand firm in the freedom of Christ? How, how would I be able to resist the voices that would be able to drag me back into pain, into despair, and into slavery and bondage again? How could I live a life truly operating in the freedom of Christ so that I don't find myself back here again with shame, with guilt, with pain for me, for the people around me? How many of you think that would be a really great thing to know? How do we live? How do we stand firm in the freedom of Christ? This phrase that Paul uses, stand firm, um, it's it's a popular phrase for Paul, actually. He uses it multiple other times. Um, And he uses it specifically, most famously, in Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians six is uh, the passage, the famous passage, if you don't know it, it's it's about the armor of God. And it's this idea that that there would be attacks from the enemy, and and his encouragement is to put on the armor of God so that the attacks of the enemy, so that the voices that would attempt to bring us back would hold no power over us. So I'm gonna read this for you, ready? And as I read this, I want you, you can tally it off on a notepad, count it off in your fingers, or just know how many times um, Paul says the phrase stand or stand firm in this passage. Are you ready? Pay attention with me. Ephesians chapter six, verse 10 says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his, in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith uh, with which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God." Paul's making a really outrageous or a really bold, probably is a better way to say this assumption, making a bold assumption here. He's saying that the the voices, the external voices we hear, whether it's from our culture, from our family, from our loved ones, from our friends, whatever it is that would attempt to bring us back and lead us back into slavery and bondage. Paul is making this claim that, that those voices have the ability to be hijacked by the purposes of the enemy. Please hear me now. Paul is telling us very clearly 
that you and I do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our enemy, hear me, our enemy is not our culture. Our enemy is not our parents. Our enemy is not our friends, but is the spiritual forces and the authorities and the powers of the evil one that would come and hijack the voices in our life for its own purposes. Can I, can I stop right here and tell, ask you guys this or tell you this? Guys, we have wasted so much time and effort believing that it is our culture that is the enemy. We have wasted so much time believing that it is our young generation that is the enemy and we just gotta fix them. We have wasted so much time believing that it is the old generation that is the enemy and we just gotta get them out. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny, but <laughs> somebody's like, I'd like to get out here. <laughs> We have wasted this time, this effort, believing that is, that is something, that it's the government officials that are the enemy, that is the people who hold power in companies and business that is the enemy. And Paul is telling us that, it, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the powers and the authorities and the evil spirits that would come and hijack the voices of our life that would attempt to drag us back into slavery and bondage. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Amen? Amen? So Paul is telling us this, put on the full armor of God. What does it mean to put on the full armor of God? How might we resist the voices of the enemy that would drag us back into slavery? He says, surround yourself, encompass yourself with the righteousness of Christ. Put on Christ's righteousness, dwell in his righteousness, because when we believe that it is Christ that makes us right, not ourselves, we do not need to strive to become better, to do better, to become more loved, because we believe that it is Christ himself who makes us right. He says, put on his peace, dwell into his peace so that we don't make decisions out of anxiety or out of insecurity because we are so revolved around the peace of God that we can stand firm in the freedom of Christ. Take his word and his spirit so that we can decipher between what is true and what is wrong so that when the arrows of the enemy come our way, they hold no power against us. Put on the full armor of God so that, so that, so that you can stand firm in the freedom of Christ. How many of us would love to live life that way? No longer bound to the chains that would hold us. So what are some practical ways that we can do this? And here's my encouragement for you. My encouragement for you, for us, for our church, would be to create rhythms in your life where you can surround yourself with the Spirit of God, with his community, and with the righteousness of Christ. Create regular rhythms in your life where you can position yourself in front of the Holy Spirit so that his spirit can work and transform our heart. Rhythms of investing in his word and his spirit through prayer and through scripture. Rhythms of investing in community where people would be able to call you out and say, hey, you're acting a little bit judgmental or prideful here, or you're kind of going down your own path here, and I think it's heading towards destruction. Having people in our lives that would be able to build us up and support us when we need to you. Investing in times of prayer and rest. This might sound odd, but I fully believe this to be true. I really believe that nothing like rest fights against the attacks of the enemy. You're like, what are you talking about? Think with this for a minute. When you choose to rest, you are making an outward display and an outward action to decide and to choose that I do not need to keep working, to keep striving, to keep becoming something, to do something, uh, to make my own way so that God will love me more, so that others will love me more. I am choosing, I am actively choosing to take a break and to put the rest of the world in God's hands. And it is an act of surrender. Say, Holy Spirit, today I am not working. Today I am choosing to rest in you. And I believe that my own righteousness, my own ability to make something for myself is not for me, but it's from you. And it's an outward display to, to surrender to the Spirit of God. 
What would it look like if we could create rhythms of rest where we surrender ourselves in front of his spirit so that we can stand firm in the freedom of Christ? Man, I think we crave, we crave that kind of life. No longer bound, living in love, in peace, in grace, in truth, in courage, in boldness. We crave that life. Stand firm in the freedom of Christ. I'm gonna have the worship team come up as we close. So there's probably two groups of people inside of this room, and I'm gonna speak to both of you guys directly, and I have found myself in both of these categories myself. First group of people is, there's a very good possibility is that you're here and you feel as if God is distant or you are far from God and the struggle is, is that you're, you're hesitant to even come close to God because you do not want to be like any of those stiff-necked, religious, hardness of heart people who don't love anybody, who are just mean and angry all of their life. And you don't want to have to worry about the regulations and the rules that God has put on you. So that's one group. Second group, I more commonly find myself in this one, is that I struggle with judgmentalism. I struggle with pride, that I'm better than that person, that I've, I can achieve more than that person, and what are they doing with their lives? If they could just get their lives together and live it like mine, then they would be fine. And if that's you, I have some encouragement for you. Matthew 11, these are the words of Jesus. It's not gonna be on your screen, but I'm just gonna encourage you to take this in and read it. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Church of God, Jesus did not come to put extra burdens or another yoke. He says, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. He has come to remove burdens off of us. So if you are, or you feel you are far from God and you don't want to come any steps closer because of the way that people have treated you, the encouragement of Jesus is this, my burden is easy, my yoke is light, and my, I will give you rest for your souls. And if you find yourself in a place where you struggle with judgmentalism or legalism, moralism, the same is true, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And the encouragement for both of us, for both groups of people, is to follow Jesus and to live your life the way that Jesus lived. To follow Jesus and to live your life the way that Jesus lived. Because when we live our life the way that Jesus lived, the burden is easy. The yoke is light, and we can stand firm in the freedom of Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, we invite you here to encourage us to take steps closer to you, that we can live our lives in line with the truth of your gospel. Lord, for those of us who are here who are enslaved in either camp, whether it be legalism or their own laws and their own rules, Lord, we pray that both camps, that we would all come together to follow you, Jesus, that our lives would be transformed, that, that you, Jesus, would be the center of our universe, the thing that pulls the gravity of our life towards you. Father, we pray that all of these things remain true in your son's name, amen. Hey, let's stand and let's worship as we close.